who saw it online and was um, intrigued by it. I think this past year, we have watched in horror the Russian brutality and destruction in Ukraine, wondering what can we do? Tonight, we'll be learning about a kind of destruction of particular interest to JHSM, the destruction of history, its documents, music, books, artifacts, et cetera, a war on a culture, including the heritage of the Jewish community in Ukraine. And this is particularly disturbing because number one, we are a society devoted to preserving history, particularly Jewish history, and also because many Detroit and Michigan Jews are linked by family heritage to Ukraine. And as Jews, the people of the book, destruction of a culture is just simply an abomination. So tonight, we're really fortunate to have with us three unique people who will tell us about Sucho. Sucho, which stands for Save Ukrainian Cultural Heritage Online, an international initiative. Now, I have seen the bios of these three women, and they are so technical and difficult for me to understand that I summarize them, and I'm hoping that during the program, they will be able to explain in detail, either in the question and answer period or uh, during the, the program itself, exactly what they do on their day in their day jobs. But I will give you what, um, what I was able to ascertain uh, about these amazing uh, three women. And by the way, if you have questions for the Q&A, please put them in the chat and we'll be um, taking your questions at the end of their presentation. So first I'd like to introduce you to Anna Kias. She's from Tufts University. She's the head Lilly Music Librarian, co-founder, co one of the co-founders of Sucho, one of three of them. She's an administrative chair of the Music Encoding Initiative. And if you want to know more about that, I'm sure she'll be happy to tell you. Next, we have Quinn Dombrowski from Stanford University, academic technology specialist in the Division of Literatures, Cultures, Languages, and in the library at Stanford. She is also a co-founder of Sucho. And third, please welcome Kylie Jolliker, She's a metadata strategies librarian at Syracuse University. And there's much more to be said about all three of them, but I know that you are interested in hearing from them. You know, a year ago, the subject of saving Ukrainian culture in 2022 or 2023 would not have even been on our radar. And now we have three experts who are doing that. So I turn the program over to our three panelists and. Welcome. Thank you. Thank you, Hillary and Jeannie, for that great introduction. And we are all happy to be here with you tonight. Um, we have a short video that we'll start our presentation with, and then we'll give you an overview of the work that we've been doing and some examples from our work. Um, and hopefully we'll have time at the end for questions. So I'm gonna share my screen. And let's see here. You need to turn the sound on. I don't think the audio is coming through, Anna. Oh, We're not I'm sorry. Volume. You're not getting the sound. Okay. Um, I didn't have an option to use optimized sound. Here, there's sorry. Something Hold you on. Can, before you share, there's <laughs> something you can do for sound. There, there usually is, but I didn't see anything here. Um, I'm sorry. 
Hold on um, one second. Um, I'm looking on my end. Let me, because usually I have to do the drop down from the top to share my sound at the top. Did it come not pop up at the top? I'm I'm seeing it with the with the screen share when I click it I can I can do the video if that helps. Do you want to do the video? Okay. Sorry yeah, about that everyone. Yeah, let me let me let me try. Okay. All right. There's no technical project without technical challenges. <laughs> All right. I will share my screen. I'll share this one and then we will share the sound. We will optimize for video clip. And let's see if this works any better. Oh. Sorry, almost there. Let's go here. When the invasion occurred on February 24th, I was actually getting ready for a conference. Russian airstrikes bombard Ukraine. I couldn't look away. This is a war about who gets to have a country, who gets to have a language, who gets to have a culture. I knew that there were materials that are really unique and precious in Ukrainian institutions that were in immediate danger or at risk. There are these amazing digital collections readily available on the web, but they're just as in danger when there's a crisis. We grew concerned that things might happen to Ukrainian digital cultural heritage. The infrastructure of the internet that we rely on is very complicated. And so to understand when a website is a risk is really not an easy task. In a situation like now, where we have a war in a country, these digital collections are on servers that need to be maintained by people and they're just as at risk as physical objects. A missile could hit the server and the equipment could be blown up. Once it goes down, if it doesn't come back up, it, it's gone. Everybody was trying to find a way to help. I tweeted out that I was going to run a data rescue uh, workshop for a bunch of music librarians. When I saw Anna's tweet, that sort of broke through my sense of paralysis with the war. From a historian's perspective, I thought, okay, what else should be saved? We all got together and people told people and those people signed up and they told their friends and they signed up. By the end of that first week, we were around a thousand volunteers. There are things that we can do. Our goal with Sucho is to capture cultural heritage websites, and we define that really broadly. Websites of museums, galleries, libraries. We have poems and, and we have short stories a 3D walking tour of an archaeological site. The list of all the sites that we have archived, the need to archive, goes into a tremendously huge Google Sheet. Thank yeah, you. I think at some point I saw 130 people editing at the same time, simultaneously. We have a group of people whose primary task is situation monitoring, watching the air raid alerts and the other attack alerts for different regions of Ukraine, and then checking our giant spreadsheet to see what remains undone from those areas that are currently under attack. A memorable story for me was the state archive of Kharkiv, uh, the second biggest city of Ukraine. On the night of the 3rd of March, I just picked it from the list and managed to save its web archive, like 100 gigabytes. Um, and then a few hours later, the situation monitoring team actually said uh, the state archive of Kharkiv has been damaged and it actually went down and hasn't come up since. The big lesson from Sucho has been how amazingly technology can empower a community if you manage to find the right tools. We use a set of um, archiving software. Um, first of all, we submit links to the Internet Archive, but then we rely on an open source uh, software suite that is called Web Recorder. 
we have so many people that came together and mobilized to work on this effort and it wouldn't work otherwise. We realized, uh, much to our surprise, that we, we seem to be the first, perhaps, uh, wartime web archiving project. And we don't know when the war is going to end. We don't know how long we'll need to hold on to these things. But our goal is that when the Ukrainian cultural heritage workers are in a position to rebuild, we'll have what they need to be able to do that. When librarians get together, amazing things can happen. Great. Thank you for uh, playing the video, Quinn, and apologies again for the technical difficulties. <laughs> um, so I'm going to share my screen now and start the slide presentation that we have for you. <clears throat> so as you heard in the video, um, a little bit about what Sucho is, Saving Ukrainian Cultural Heritage Online, we are a global grassroots initiative. Uh, we have more than 1,500 volunteers. And uh, those volunteers at this point, um, Kylie, uh, who you'll hear from a little bit later, uh, did some kind of data analysis and found that we have people from over 38 countries around the globe. So this is a pretty amazing um, group of people that are working together to support the digital preservation of Ukrainian cultural heritage. And Many of us are librarians. We have archivists, historians, humanities researchers, and technologists in our group. We also have uh, children who um, are helping us web archive. You'll hear a little bit more about that from Quinn, um, as well as retirees um, and regular people who just have a desire to help us. Um, so it's a really lovely community of people that are working together. Um, and we've you know, since March 1st of 2022, we've web archived over 5,000 websites, which is over a little over 50 terabytes of web archive data. Um, and just to give you a perspective of that, one terabyte of storage is roughly the same as what you can store on 16 iPhones that have about 64 gigabytes. So this is a lot of data that we've been able to preserve. And our goal is to keep this digital content safe, as you heard in the video, um, back it up and keep it for a duration of time until we can then return it back to its owners in Ukraine when they are ready to rebuild. Um, if they need it because their web content, their sites, their collections have gone down, um, we can then hand it back to them. So today we're going to give you an overview um, of what we've already done in what we call phase one, which is the phase in which we did all of this web archiving of the 5,400 websites and 50 plus terabytes of data. Um, the, the second phase, which we started working on in about mid to late summer of 2022 and is still ongoing, um, you'll hear from uh, Kylie um, and Quinn about where we've curated um, metadata, we are raising funds for digitization equipment, we're creating educational resources, and then we'll wrap up with some next steps and then a Q&A that will engage with you. So I'll start by just talking a little bit about um, you know, what we've been seeing since 2022, which is this intentional targeting of culture. I'm sure that you've all seen these horrendous images of damaged buildings, of burning buildings, of looted artifacts. Um, it's all over the news on social media, as well as newspapers and um, television. And you know, scholars, journalists, politicians are all in agreement that this is an intentional targeting of Ukrainian culture, of Ukrainian people, their life, their language, and anything that would um, show that Ukraine is a separate country with its own history and its own culture. Um, and since the beginning of the war, um, and even before the attack in February of 2022, uh, there was already activity in terms of um, cyber attacks that were happening on the technical infrastructure of Ukraine. Um, and this uh, type of attack, what it does is it causes websites to go offline so that if you go to a URL 
you may not be able to access that page. Um, but it also was uh, deliberate destruction of uh, websites and content that was online, as well as physical content. And so the physical artifacts that are being destroyed, um, these are being monitored and um, assessed and listed by organizations such as the Ministry of Culture in Ukraine, UNESCO, um, the International Council of Museums, and other organizations that are trying to protect the cultural heritage. Um, and so this is this screenshot here is just showing you um, a it's a database that is being compiled with the help of regular people in Ukraine who are identifying what they see happening around them. So shelling and fire damage to buildings, artillery fire, missiles, et cetera, um, that are damaging physical monuments, cemeteries, churches, mosques, synagogues, et cetera. And they're compiling all of this data so that then they can have evidence for criminal prosecution of people who were involved in these crimes. Um, and at this point, through November 30th of 2022, this is the most recent number. In the video, you heard that when we recorded that video in late May, early June, there were around 200 or so cultural heritage sites that had been identified as damaged. Um, this number has grown exponentially, and it's over 1,600 now potentially damaged cultural heritage sites that have been identified by this conflict observatory, which is a group that's working with the Smithsonian and several other institutions in the United States. Um, and the map here just shows you the places around Ukraine that have sustained this damage. Um, and the darker the shade of the uh, geographic location on the map means the larger the destruction or the greater the destruction in that area. And they also are monitoring the site types that are receiving the damage. So the physical heritage sites that are receiving the most damage, um, again, demonstrate that this is an intentional targeting of culture because the Russians are targeting memorials and monuments. They're targeting places of worship and burial, um, again, to erase the identity and memory of Ukrainian people. Um, so, these are things that are being damaged that are physical uh, artifacts, that are physical buildings, monuments on the ground. Um, but the web uh, content is just as precarious and at risk um, of being damaged. So our web archiving efforts have focused on identifying which of these cultural heritage um, uh, artifacts and objects might be at risk using those resources that I just showed you from the Ministry of Culture, from UNESCO, et cetera. Um, and we are identifying during the web archiving period, thinking about, okay, what is at risk of being damaged? Where is it hosted? Um, the content such as books that have been digitized, photographs, manuscripts that are in archives, for example, they're all sitting on servers. And these servers, when they're destroyed or attacked, then can potentially um, mean that that object or those objects that are on that website are no longer accessible and may not be accessible afterwards either. Um, this chart here just shows that um, the fluctuation in websites and outages between October and November of 2022. But just to give you a sense of the line on the top, the orange line is sort of this consistent minor fluctuations of websites, um, you know, there may be outages for different reasons, uh, electrical outages that are very brief, but the websites and the internet comes right back. The blue line is the um, showing you the outages that are occurring in Ukraine on Ukrainian hosted content. And so you'll notice that the dips are much lower than kind of that baseline at the top. Um, and so there's a sharp decline on November 15th, which is it coincides with the Russian attack of over 100 missiles or so across cities in Ukraine, which led to massive internet outages that were not seen earlier. Um, so again, these are all the things that we've been conscious of and looking at um, in order to be able to identify and think about, okay, what needs to be web archived? Because it's not only at risk of being physically damaged, but the digital content is also at risk of disappearing. 
So I'm going to turn it over to Quinn now to um, walk you through the next um, kind of a uh, few slides. Thanks, Anna. Um, so yeah, as you saw in the video, um, we one of the ways that we've described this project is a, a digital Dunkirk. Um, we'll archive websites on pretty much anything that can boot and connect to the internet. And um, you can see here a sample of some of the devices and setups. We, we asked some of our volunteers to send us pictures of what their workspace looked like. Um, and, and there were lots of people who had pulled um, ancient laptops and desktops like out of closets and, and boot them up for the first time, maybe installed a new operating system and connected them to the internet to you know bring them into action to be able to help with the web archiving. Um, we even had some volunteers using a, uh, you know, Raspberry Pi device, a sort of minimal computer in the upper right, um, where they, they wrote out some instructions for how you can um, install the software that we're using for doing web archiving, uh, even on, um, you know, something that barely passes as a computer. Next slide. There we go. Um, so this is this is what it looked like, um, you know, for the volunteers working on the project. This is our our uh, you know famous or infamous um, you know gigantic spreadsheet. Um, you can see uh, we have many many columns and you know thousands upon thousands of rows. Uh, you know, these were uh, websites that came in through all kinds of different channels, things that people had contributed, people, things that people had submitted to the form. We worked with some of the volunteers to um, take entire databases worth of websites and add them to the list. Um, we did a variety of things, um, especially towards the beginning, um, to check and see whether the site was, you know, actually physically hosted on a server in Ukraine or outside the country, thinking that the, uh, you know, ones that were hosted in Ukraine were most susceptible to physical damage, missile attacks, power outages, and things like that. What we realized over time, though, is that, um, you know, websites that are run by Ukrainians um, but hosted outside the country are not necessarily in that much of a better position um, because refugees aren't necessarily great about paying for their web hosting bills. And so we were seeing some websites, even those outside of Ukraine, going down due to non-payment. Um, and there's no guarantee that the, the web host that wasn't paid um, is going to retain the files once um, they're no longer being paid for. So at that point, we, we opened it up to, you know, any site with a, you know, tie uh, directly or indirectly, you know, to Ukraine related to cultural heritage, which vastly expanded the pool of things we were working with. Next slide. Um, yes, yeah, so this is broadly speaking at a high level, like what the process looked like for the web archiving phase of the project. Um, you know, we went all over the place to look for URLs, people would submit links, we went to Wikidata, um, we actually had people um, going through Google Maps for um, cities that were under attack and looking for the cultural heritage icon, just like clicking through slowly street by street, um, looking for museums that we didn't have, um, and then adding them to our list if, if we didn't have them already. Uh, we had some degree of prioritization. Um, this is tied into our situation monitoring efforts, um, you know, to try to capture things from areas that were, you know, particularly actively under attack or at risk. Um, we then did some triage. Um, there were some sites that were running software that just were very, very difficult to archive um, using the tools that we typically use. And so those sort of went into special cases for people to uh, look into capturing in some other way. Um, then we would capture the sites through one means or another, and we had a, a quality control check at the end um, for um, with the multilingual volunteers who could actually read the content uh, to make sure that we weren't missing any major sections of the sites. Um, so this is an example of the, the situation monitoring work um, led by Erica Peasley, who uh, was monitoring. There are um, you know various different messaging apps that are widely used in Ukraine. Um, and so she was following the the public channels on those that would basically like announce, um, you know, sort of via these internet chat apps, um, you know, where there were air raid alerts or other attack alerts um, and at what time. And then she'd sort of connect that back to our spreadsheet um, in order to identify uh, different rows in the spreadsheet that um, would be worth capturing right away um, for any volunteers who were online at that time. And because of our time zone span, uh, that was pretty much all the time um, as, as kind of the far western edge of the project in California, um, it was always kind of uh, reassuring that, you know, I could go to bed at 11 or midnight, um, seeing the the volunteers in Sweden waking up for the morning, um, and the work would just continue around the clock. So we we really brought together all kinds of people for this project, um, you know, not just your, your usual group of, you know, highly technical 
um, developer types who often do this kind of thing. Um, you know, early on in the project, one of our volunteers sat down with his six-year-old um, to archive a website using the the browser trick software, and had her draw um, in the upper right here um, what what she was doing. Um, so that was she she sort of was able to draw you know how there's an attack going on on the other side of the world, and she's able to to save a Ukrainian website. And this you know it was March seventeenth, like even the first couple of weeks of the war. And, and the thought occurred, it's like, you know, I, I too have young children and a local PTA. Um, and so we we organized um, what might have been the first ever, um, you know, web archiving for kids session um, at an elementary school. Um, we, we did it over Zoom, um, you know, for COVID reasons, among others, um, you know, families would log in. Uh, we had a little discussion about, you know, talking to your kids about the war. Um, and then we all got together and archived websites off of a little curated list of kind of kid oriented sites, you know, like children's libraries and museums and things like that that we were able to find. Um, and, you know, I, I heard back from a lot of parents later that like that was something that you know, meant a lot to them and their kids to feel like they could actually, you know, do something to contribute uh, from the other side of the world. So these are are some examples of some of the things that we've captured. Anna, do you want to talk about these these first few examples, and I'll get to. Sure, I can do that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'll talk about a couple of the examples here. So these are from the the first phase of web archiving, um, and again, this map is just for perspective of the you know this is Ukraine here, and what we. Um, try to prioritize and identify websites from institutions from across Ukraine, from all the regions um, and different oblasts. So these include websites that document places where people may learn and engage with cultural heritage. They include institutions of all sizes, as well as public and national organizations, whether that's libraries or archives, historical societies, music academies, and even rural museums, um, synagogues, churches, uh, so religious um, archives as well. And a few of these examples that I can show next here. Um, so some of the content has gone into the Internet Archive. Um, some of you may be familiar with the Internet Archive where you can access different books and, and media. Um, and so the, here are just a couple of examples that have been uploaded directly to the Internet Archive. One of these examples is this 18th century music manuscript by Artemy Vedel. Um, and this manuscript, the original, is housed at the National Library of Ukraine, um, but uh, the digital copy has now been preserved uh, not only on their own uh, digital collection software, but also in the Internet Archive. So in case something happens to their copy, um, you can still access it. Um, Another example of what we've web archived are these photographs from a theater in Kharkiv. And this is just one uh, image from a performance in 1926 of an actress named Nadia Titarenko. Um, and um, there are many more that we've web archived from this collection as well that you can still access online. Architectural styles have been web archived. And these are pretty, um, I think, important to uh, you know, to point out because these are buildings and physical um, objects that are located across Ukraine that are currently being unfortunately attacked and destroyed. Um, and so having documentation of these buildings is really important to be able to show that, you know, these buildings existed at a certain point in time. So archiving these websites um, ensures that if servers are destroyed, these collections are damaged, physical items or buildings are damaged, if there's a copy of what these things looked like before the invasion. So one, one of the uh, the strengths of the project was because we had so many volunteers, each with their own um, kind of interests and, and passions, um, this led us to kind of think more broadly about cultural heritage, including things that are, um, you know, kind of not usually considered under that umbrella. So uh, we we also collected things like you know children's after school programs um, with Ukrainian language programs and uh, you know dance schools and these these are places that you know where the the cultural heritage of Ukraine is alive in people's everyday lives. Uh, with this example on the right here in particular, it was. Um, you know, really striking. I, I archived this site, you know, one evening, and then I saw that the city was in the news because of um, an ammonia leak that was making it um, even more dangerous there than, you know, just with the attacks. 
And um, I, I went back to check on the website later to see if it was still up and if it was still there. And what I realized was in the days before the war started, they were posting um, every single day with blog posts, you know, the children's art activities. There was there was a wonderful one that was their last uh, their last post of, um, you know, an art project called I'm Ukrainian and that sounds proud with you know kids painting um, maps of the country and sunflowers. And when I went back to check on it later, that blog post had been taken down, um, presumably to avoid uh, kind of drawing attention to the place unnecessarily um, with the Russian invaders. So, um, you know, the, the materials that we've captured are, are, are really uh, wide ranging and, um, you know, I hope that they have a, a backup copy of, of those photos from that art activity, but if not, we do and, and we look forward to, to giving it back. Another um, interesting and challenging kind of content that we were able to capture are these 3D virtual tours. This, this seems to be a big thing in uh, the web design, at least at these Ukrainian museums, um, you know, where it's, it's this sort of robust interactive thing where you can sort of like click through and zoom in and move around um, a space, you know, the space of a, you know, inside a museum or outside a museum or the entire grounds of a monastery or, or things like that. Um, and we had volunteers who, you know, essentially specialized by the end in, in capturing these 3D virtual tours and all of the many, many images that, that make up these, these digital objects. So we're going to turn it over um, in a moment to Kylie, who's going to talk about some of the work that's happening in this second phase. And um, the second phase here, we, we came up with um, kind of this catchphrase, curate, donate, and educate, uh, because as you can imagine, when you have a lot of data or files, um, you have to organize them in some way that makes sense. Um, to the people that are going to then want them back. <laughs> so we're doing a lot of this kind of curation and organization of all of that web data, um, but we're also taking the time to uh, display some of it in a gallery that's online, as well as in the Internet Archive, so that other people from around the globe can see some of the, these uh, you know, pieces of artwork, these beautiful images, different books and artifacts from across Ukraine that have been web archived, so they can also learn more about the Ukrainian culture. Um, the other part of this phase is donating and raising funds. So we have been working on donating digitization equipment and raising funds to do that kind of work um, and sending that equipment over to Ukrainian institutions that need it for scanning content, for doing digital imagery with cameras, for example. Um, there's a whole host of what um, kind of technology needs they have. And then the final piece is education. And so with the work that we're doing with the gallery, with our memes that you'll hear about later, um, as well as with the digitization equipment, it all requires some kind of training and educational resources that we're um, working on building and developing in this phase. Uh, so I'm going to pass it over to Kylie, who's going to tell us a bit more about the gallery. Thanks, Anna. So the gallery um, started when we were kind of shifting into phase two initially um, in May of 2022. We started um, kind of collecting things that we wanted to share from uh, websites that we had already web archived. By July of 2022, we were able to publish the first sets of items on a platform called Omeka, which is an open source platform that is specifically for this usage of presenting collections of digital objects in the cultural heritage sector. As you just heard from Anna, um, you'll see reflected here that kind of curate, donate, educate uh, is reflected in the gallery as well. Part of the mission is to raise funding. As you'll see in a, in a moment, we're sharing this material that, that isn't ours and we're not claiming at any point that it is ours because we wanna draw attention to the work that's being done by these other institutions and organizations. And we want to be able to raise funding that we can use to help them. This also involves raising awareness of the work that they're doing and of Ukrainian cultural heritage on a more, on, in a more general sense. 
um, and also to provide learning materials that, again, may not otherwise be available at this point um, from the kinds of damage that you've heard about. When uh, we start putting together things for the gallery, um, we have been focusing initially on the web scraped materials uh, that we have collected through the first phase of the project. We're also um, planning to include any kind of digitized materials from partners in Ukraine who want to use the gallery as a digital collections platform for things that they want to share but maybe don't have the capacity to do so at the moment. Um, Part of this really involves an emphasis on Ukrainian language. So there is a Ukrainian interface um, and also all of our metadata, which is our kind of data about data, which is not necessarily the most helpful definition, but you can kind of think of it as a nutrition facts label that you might find on food where it tells you what's actually in it. So this slightly blurry screenshot um, gives you an idea of some of the things that you might see in the gallery um, where it describes where this object that we're sharing um, was originally scraped from, um, if it's one of the web scraped materials, and if not, who is responsible for the ownership of it. Um, that way folks can go, they can check out that website, they can see more of the material that's there. Um, and we're also including links to the archived copies, particularly in situations where that website may not still be online. Um, we also include information about the host institution, where it's located, um, and what kind of institution it is. And each of these values can link across different items that are on the gallery. That way folks can explore and learn about different things that they might be curious about or interested in, or maybe things that they've never even heard of before. This is a little example of how some of the things display. These are some of our oldest items that we've added to date. Um, and each one, when you click on it, uh, it opens up to reveal the full information that we've collected about it. And then, of course, the link to view it on the original website or the archived copy of it uh, for the full information provided by that original um, source. These are uh, some items that I picked out uh, to share with you all tonight um, to give kind of a, an idea of some of the assortment of things that we have, especially these that are specifically related to Jewish history in Ukraine. Um, we have many, many images of buildings in particular. Um, this one is a pre-revolution, so pre-1917 photograph of the Big Coral Synagogue in Berdichiv, um, which is in northern Ukraine. Uh, and as you can see, the original source um, was an organization called History of Jewish Communities in Ukraine. This site is still online, um, but we have it linked from the gallery. That way folks can see it. They can go and explore further in depth. Um, we also have other photographs um, that are culturally significant, such as families, people, um, oftentimes performing, whether it's in theater, music, dance, etc. cetera. Um, on the left here, a photograph, um, I wasn't able to find a good date of it, um, but a group of klezmers from Ushomir, uh, again, in Northern Ukraine, still close, the same geographic area. Um, and it's also from that same site, as is the photograph on the right, uh, members of the Umansky family. This is from the 1960s um, and is very culturally significant because this family returned um, to Ananyev after having fled during the war. Um, so their family returned and they are part of a very, very small population still to date in that area. Um, we also have a few other organizations that we have added to date. Um, many of which share uh, landmarks such as um, cemeteries and specific images of inscriptions and monuments and headstones in those areas. Um, two of them on the left here are from the uh, Ushimir Jewish Cemetery in northern Ukraine. Um, some of these on the right here um, are recovered stones um, that had been found in that cemetery. I'm not entirely clear on what the what the state of that cemetery is right now. This is a photograph from several years ago, so this is not um, any kind of, of damage or situation related specifically to this war. Um, 
but they're from uh, Rohatin, I may not be pronouncing that correctly, I apologize, um, in Western Ukraine. We also have other things um, such as digitized documents and images of memorials and monuments. On the left is a, a kind of small image of the uh, main monument part of Dravitsky Yar, which was opened in 2002. And part of the monument, which is not visible in this image, um, was actually destroyed by Russian forces in March of 2022. So part of that monument is no longer, um, it, it's partially standing, but it is no longer intact. On the right um, is an image of a digitized book that's available on the archived website. Um, we provided an image of it, that way folks can see this uh, page describing it and the metadata describing it, and then um, find the full version of it available either on the website or the web archived copy. Uh, it was a vital records book uh, from 1856, um, recording deaths in uh, Kiev Oblast. We also have a separate website um, that is dedicated to the collection of memes that have been shared on social media. We have a specific, um, specifically designed platform that we're using for this, and it is the meme wall. Um, this is something that I have gotten a lot of questions about in the past year of, of why we're doing this and why it's culturally significant. Um, we are not creating any of these memes. We're just collecting them as we find them on social media. And there's a dedicated team, again, as with the other projects that monitors um, areas of social media on different platforms um, and collects these as they appear. And the reason that these are so culturally significant in particular is that uh, many of them are being actively used to combat disinformation. So when disinformation or propaganda is shared on various social media platforms, the response is given in memes, um, which is a very, very interesting way of, of spreading anti-disinformation. In some cases, it's directly giving information, um, but not in the way that you'd expect. It's not a necessarily debunking of the disinformation, but rather a response to it. Um, oftentimes it is ridiculing uh, Russian military leadership, um, Russian governmental leadership. And there are so many different kinds of memes that get shared um, that it is very difficult to keep up with, as you can imagine. Um, but a lot of them are collected here. Um, they're uh, very ephemeral, just as what we've talked about with the fact that websites, although they seem permanent or at least semi-permanent, are actually very fragile. Memes are as well. They might appear, circulate for a short period of time, and then disappear almost entirely, and it can be very, very difficult to find them again. So collecting them as they're appearing um, is the best way to ensure that they have some sort of longevity um, in their relationship with the kind of information ecosystem that's arisen around the war. In addition, one of the things that we've realized is that there are limits to the things that we can capture using web archiving um, or any other remote digital method. Um, I mean, namely that we're we're limited by the fact that um, we can only capture those things that people have already digitized on the ground in Ukraine and made available on websites um, or or in other means. And the estimate from the Ministry for Cultural Heritage is that less than 0.1% of Ukrainian cultural heritage materials have been digitized. Um, so tiny, 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 tiny fraction uh, compared to what's possible. And there are um, you know, are, are many different approaches to digitizing these things there in the past have been, uh, you know, commercial companies that have partnered, you know, with Ukrainian archives to try to capture genealogical records. Um, you know, things can get very complicated, but we've, we've realized that like 
fundamentally, um, you know, we need to step up and help get more scanners on the ground in Ukraine, um, you know, help produce pedagogical materials for organizations that are trying to um, either create or scale up the digitization efforts um, and really put the tools in the hands of the people who can use them. So uh, to date, we've raised over uh, 200,000 euros towards digitization equipment. Um, we've developed digitization kits and um, we're working on creating these digitization hubs in Ukraine. In addition, uh, given the recent power challenges in Ukraine, um, we've added power banks to um, kind of as an essential part of those kits. And those are things that people can use right away, you know, charge them when there is power and then have them as a resource for the community um, when there isn't power, um, you know, just for people to come in and charge their their phones and sort of have the libraries and archives sort of become community hubs in a different way uh, during the war. Next slide. Um, so this is this is one um, case study of what we've been able to do with a, a regional library in Ukraine, the, the Cherkasy Regional Library. Um, they had a fundraiser for digitization equipment. Um, were able to raise enough on their own to get kind of a, a small um, small scale kind of personal digital scanner to be able to um, capture uh, art created by children, um, mostly internally displaced children um, in Ukraine who were were then part of their library community. Um, and, you know, Sucho was able to provide them with a uh, book eye professional scanner um, that not only they will be able to use, but museums nearby and in the same region will be able to come and bring their materials and use those as well. Um, there are tons of logistical challenges we've discovered um, getting this equipment into Ukraine and getting things um, from one place to another within Ukraine. Um, even if you can manage to get stuff delivered uh, to Ukraine, it's almost certainly going to go to Kyiv. And then the question is, um, how do you get it off to um, these more remote areas? But these are these are struggles that we are working together um, with our community to address, and we're we're making some headway, and we're looking forward to being able to put put more of these tools in the hands of librarians and archivists. So for our next steps, um, you've already heard quite a bit about the gallery and the gallery work still continues. So we are planning to expand the metadata. Um, we're working on expanding the subject headings and making it easier for people to search and to be able to find objects within the gallery. Um, we're constantly adding items from regions of Ukraine that we have not yet fully represented in the gallery. Um, so that is one of the goals is to try and include web archived content from every single oblast and re region in administrative district, for example, in Ukraine, um, as well as look at the content that is represented. So for example, um, adding more content that may be related to Jewish communities in Ukraine. We also have, as I mentioned previously, a lot of uh, metadata and other data that still needs to be curated. Um, so that is ongoing work that our volunteers are still working on this um, at this time in this year. Um, and of course, the big, big thing that we're concerned about is preventing future losses. Um, so as we're doing tonight, and as we've been doing since March of 2022, um, we are going to continue raising awareness about the importance of web archiving um, and the need for digital preservation going forward so that it is something that is more proactively done rather than as um, a response to a natural disaster or to a war, in the, as in this case. Um, we are hoping to donate more digitization equipment, as um, you heard just from Quinn a moment ago, um, and to continue creating resources and training opportunities. And anyone can help. <laughs> you can visit our site, sucho.org, um, to read more about what we've been doing and what um, we are currently up to. We are still taking volunteers. So if you would like to volunteer or you know someone who might want to volunteer and help, um, they can sign up and we'll be in touch with them. Um, and of course, donations for purchasing equipment to give to the institutions is always welcome as well. Um, so you can go to any of these links, which are all on the sucho.org website, um, and you can follow them there. Um, and I think at this time, we can take questions and um, maybe get started with this discussion. So I'm going to stop sharing. And... 
Oh, somebody, are, oh, thank you, Hillary. You already put sucho.org in the web, in the chat box there. Perfect. Check. Thank, thank you so much. I, I've always loved librarians since I was seven years old and they became an important part of my life. And um, you are really amazing librarians. Um, and thank you for what you're doing is just incredible. In fact, um, in the chat, I don't know if, how to pronounce the name Olia or Olia, um, has said that Sucha warriors, warriors, you are amazing. So I think we all share that sentiment completely. Um, while we're waiting for some questions, and um, I, I had so many thoughts. First of all, you did say that you needed more volunteers, and I guess they can be anybody, but because we're the Jewish Historical Society, we certainly have um, access to historians nationally, and we have access to archivists, but is, does that matter, or are you just looking for volunteers of any size and shape? And um, additionally, if someone could answer the question, um, have there been any items that were not saved that are particularly tragic that you might want to tell us about? Or conversely, any items that you know of that, that have been captured and saved that really you felt very gratified about? Anybody? Yeah, sure. Um, anyone can jump in too, but um, I, I will just say in terms of volunteers, um, you know, anyone is welcome, anyone and everyone. Um, we, maybe Kylie would want to say more about this, but I think for the gallery work, uh, if there are people who have specific areas of interest in particular types of cultural heritage, we would welcome them because that's definitely something that we could put them to work with in the gallery. Um, mm -hmm. In you know, for the other parts of our work that's more technical, um, that might be appropriate for somebody who has maybe interest or um, either interest in learning or expertise with some of the technology already. But for most of the work with like the gallery, um, if you have language skills or you have interest in art and um, you know history of Ukraine or Jewish communities, um, just please get get in touch and we'll be happy to talk with you. Um, I yeah, I don't know, Kylie or Quinn, if you want to add anything to that part. Yeah, I definitely second that as far as especially the gallery in particular goes. Um, even when folks don't have uh, expertise necessarily in, in any specific areas, or maybe they haven't done this kind of work before, we have the resources, we have training materials, um, we have a, a group that meets we're moving to bi-weekly meetings um, and we meet for an hour a week and we kind of do a, a co-working session, but we also have asynchronous support basically 24 seven. Um, many of us have extremely different skill sets. We have many folks uh, working on different projects who are not librarians or archivists um, who just jumped in because they were interested and wanted to help. So they learned how to do the specific tasks that they're doing. Um, also, many of us do not speak or read Ukrainian. Uh, many of us are learning, but don't have any kind of um, necessary functional fluency yet. Um, so there really is a, a, a huge range of, of experiences that folks have brought to the work. Um, but as Anna said, if there are folks that have specific interests, that's fantastic. Um, one of the things that we do for the gallery is we go through this, this massive amount of content that has been web archived to curate these specific things that we're sharing. Um, so that work is extremely important because it enables us to then actually share it. So having folks that have specific areas of interest, even if they just want to go through materials that suit their specific interest and find things for us to draw out and share, fantastic. Um, so really anyone who's interested, we would love to have them. Good to know. In in terms of, you know, things that have been captured and things that, that haven't been captured, um, I, I know fairly early on there was one of the state archives that had a lot of the um, records of the KGB's uh, persecution of Ukrainians during the Soviet period that um, and, and like a, a tiny, tiny fraction of those had been digitized. 
And uh, I mean, that that building was bombed and um, it's not really clear sort of what the state of of the archives is after that. Um, and I mean, that that was definitely one that that hurt. Uh, we we had managed to capture the website for it in advance, but I mean, again, like the the vast majority of the stuff isn't digitized, and it's it's things like that that really um, inspired us to um, get over our initial hesitation to get into like anything dealing with the physical world, um, because you know it, it's it's much easier to do web archiving from anywhere in the world, not have to deal with you know borders and customs and import laws and and you know flights and and I mean the, the logistical complications once you get into the physical world just go up immensely. Um, but you know situations like that with the KGB archives you know, really really got us over the hurdle that like you know as as much as we really would rather not like we can't not get into the physical world um, in order to to support the people on the ground. Yeah, one Very, thing I'll add. I'm oh, sorry. I was just thinking how ironic that is. Yeah. Just so yeah. ironic. Yeah. Go one, ahead. One thing I was going to add is that. Um, you know, as we've been reviewing and keeping track of the damaged cultural heritage from the ministry and from UNESCO, we basically cross check it with, with what we've been able to web archive. And in some cases, we've identified things that we may not have yet web archived. So we go back and check, okay, is there a website? Are there digital collections? Can we get them? In many cases, there are many buildings and monuments that do not have any kind of website or digital collection. And so if those are damaged, there's no way for us to preserve, you know, the digital image of what was once there. Um, there are a number of efforts of um, organizations that are working on the ground that are, you know, helping uh, museums, libraries, archives do physical uh, uh uh what's it called i'm blanking on the world word um you know moving things for storage packing things um protecting things uh so that for example putting sandbags around monuments so they don't get destroyed when they are hit um there's a lot of emphasis on museums so there's the Museum Crisis Center, for example, that has been doing an amazing work in Ukraine, and they've been working with the museum community. Um, you know, libraries, uh, there are so many items in libraries that have not been digitized, as Quinn mentioned earlier. And so we don't know how much, you know, if a library building has been damaged, which many of them have, we don't know how much of their collection um, may not be accessible in the future because it's been burned or destroyed. We don't know. So a lot of this is still, um, you know, we're going to find out more about the destruction and loss of cultural heritage as time goes on, unfortunately, because there's just no way of really assessing all of the damage right now, especially by people like us who are not physically there. Uh, it's massive, massive amount of work. Um, I wonder if this small amount of digitalization that has you, you know now is is in Ukraine, is that common? Do you know worldwide, or is this particular to Ukraine? This is this is the default everywhere. I mean, honestly, like the the stuff the stuff that's most visible, I think, to us in the United States is. You know, often like what's what's going on in you know in in U.S. institutions with like you know emphasis on like you know more digital things. But I mean, like honestly, they're like even within like you know large, well-funded U.S. institutions. Um, I mean, if you if we think about um, you know, what percentage of you know Stanford special collections are like digitized and available online? Like even there, which I mean is is probably one of the best case scenarios um, in terms of of resources and investment in digital technologies. Like it's it's still a small percentage, um, and and sort of the further you get away from that kind of ideal like situation in libraries, um, the less likely you are to to have things digitized. Um, I think the the war has been a a major wake up call for Ukrainian cultural heritage. Heritage and and people are realizing the value of this. Um, and there there are countries that 
are um, like, you know, I think similarly, like, you know, due to like concern over like, you know, risks to their cultural heritage, deeply invested in, in you know, the digital and digitizing um, Estonia comes to mind as, as one example where like not only it, is their kind of entire governmental infrastructure um, digital, they also have what they call a digital embassy um, where like a copy of all of their government data, I, I think including things like the National Library are also stored like in Switzerland or, or, or some, somewhere offsite and safe. So even if they are invaded, um, you know, the, the digital, um, you know, government operations and, and all of the things sort of in that sphere um, will be protected. And I, I think, um, you know, I, I, I look forward to seeing how Ukraine comes out of this um, in, in terms of, you know, helping set the standard for, for how people think through these issues. I think it's worth um, kind of underlining too. one of the really good points that, that you just made, Quinn, is that this kind of being the sort of default that we see in terms of digitization, it's not possible to digitize everything because so much material is, you know, historically physical material, um, but also still things that we're producing as physical material now that would need to be digitized there's just such a massive volume everywhere in the world of every institution that has physical material. Um, it's just not possible to digitize everything, which is really one of the, the kind of frustrating things, um, even without a situation like this, where there is actually a crisis happening, because you can only digitize as much as you have the capacity for. So a lot of the conversation has to be, how can we increase that capacity? plus the kind of born digital information, which is some of the things that we have archived as well that may not have physical copies. And I just want to reiterate that because it, it came up a few times at the presentation, but some of these things only exist in the physical space. So even if we're very lucky and some of this physical material isn't damaged, we still want that, that digital copy, of course but also some of this material that was born digital, that has never had a physical manifestation, there might only be one copy of it. It might only ever exist in one place. So that's another thing to kind of think about of the fact that even though it may not be a physical tangible thing that can be damaged, if again, the server that it's on is destroyed, it's the same result, it's gone. Very interesting. I'm going to just pause for a second if anyone has another question before we conclude. Uh, Jeannie, can I ask a question? Of course, Mickey. You, you know, and I and I didn't show myself because I'm dressed scantily. Uh, oh, thank you so I'm much to the three of you. No, I'm I'm, I'm, I'm I'm dressed. Thank you, ladies. <laughs> uh, I was fascinated by each of your presentations and very moved by it and have been following what's been going on in the Ukraine since really before February 24th, as many of us in, in America and the rest of the world have. So my first question, I couldn't get it to go through, maybe it's me, it probably is, is any comparison to what the Germans did in World War II uh, in terms of raiding and destroying that can be made to what the Russians are attempting to do? We know they're trying to destroy the Ukrainian everything about Ukraine and anything that would resemble a culture. I understand that. But is there a comparison? And is it being told? I know it's being investigated and there'll be all kinds of trials and whatever eventually, but who knows what will be left. So I'm just curious if there's a comment that you might make in terms of what you're doing. And then the last thing is maybe just uh, 30 seconds or a minute of each of you, why you're doing what you're doing and how it relates to what you do regularly. I mean, this isn't your regular job. And I think maybe most of us are interested in, you know, uh, what passion, I mean, your passion obviously relates to your work, but how does that connect to what you do every day? And maybe your connection to Ukraine, if that's, if, if you're willing to do that. Anna, do you want to take the German question or I, I, I remember yeah, I can say a few words, but yeah, anyone can jump in. Um, I mean, there def there there is a uh, you know a more than just a uh, I think you know slight coincidence and or um, resemblance of what is happening now to what happened in Germ in um, when Germany was um, taking over uh, you know different parts of Europe and um, attacking countries and and. Um, I think that 
you know, since since 2014, when Russia attacked Crimea and annexed Crimea, you know, it's been sort of this. Um, it wasn't as it, we were watching this happen, but I think that people sort of became distracted, you know, with everything else that started com coming up and happening in the world, um, especially here in the States with you know, the Trump administration. Um, and I think that this invasion sort of caused us to look again and, and realize that this was a deliberate invasion and deliberate attack on a culture and identity of, of Ukrainian people. Um, and the literature and the language and the um, the statements that have been coming out of Russia and Putin in particular um, are very clear in terms of what he wants to do, right, in terms of wiping out Ukrainian identity. Exactly. Um, and the looting that has been happening and the deliberate attacks, um, you know, there's just no denial that that's what's, that's what's being done. Um, one of the things that I remember from last year was when there were people hiding and um, trying to shelter in the Mariupol theater. And you may remember this, when the Mariupol theater was attacked, there were, ch there were children in that theater um, with you know, their parents, their grandparents and communities. And they were deliberately attacked, even though there was, you know, they put words on, I don't remember if it was the roof or in front on the ground that said there's children here. So I think that there is there is a deliberate attempt to, um, to basically rid Ukraine of, um, you know, the, the people who are there and force them to submit to Russia. Um, yeah, I'll, I'll stop there because I think that this is a, <laughs> this is a, a question that we could talk about for a long time. I, you know, I, I remember uh, just to just to add to that. At one point, you know, we were talking with Sebastian, our our third co-founder, and he was going through some materials that he had archived. And one of the things that he mm -hmm. had archived was something from, um, you know, one of these archives that was, you know, the the UNESCO report um, of the war crimes tribunals of, you know, responding to what the Germans had done to Ukraine during uh, World War II. And just sort of this this like sad irony of like us web archiving the reports from the last time this happened, you know, all of which is within, you know, living memory of, of some people still in Ukraine, um, you know, the the last time and and now. And um, no, I mean, there, there are absolutely parallels and, and part of the, the goal of, of creating these archives is um, in order to hopefully use them at some point um, in uh, whatever eventual war crimes tribunals are, are put together by the United Nations after this war. Um, we've been in conversations with UNESCO um, already kind of as their like digital partner. There, there are many uh, partners invested in cultural heritage ever since World War II, um, but all of them, these you know, longstanding, you know, 50, 70 year old organizations are focused on, you know, getting physical things and protecting physical things. And, and it, it, was, it was very strange, you know, for us as like a few random people being in, you know, the, the company of like the Smithsonian and Europa Nostra and like, us three randos who met on the internet um, and are here trying to help with the digital. Um, randos? <laughs> yeah, I mean, basically, I mean, in getting to the, the question of, of why we're doing this, um, you know, I, I work in this sort of digital humanities uh, staff position at Stanford. Um, my, my background is in medieval Slavic linguistics, uh, strangely enough, and I studied Russian in high school. And you know, went to Russia in high school, and you know, the stuff I worked on was old East Slavic, um, including um, kind of the the sort of predecessors of modern Ukrainian. And um, you know, there's an activist thread um, within digital humanities, sort of socially engaged digital humanities. There's been several projects responding to um, like the Trump administration's family separation policy, um, Hurricane Marina, Maria, other events like that. Um, but I'd never really gotten involved in those before. Like I, I always, one way or another, I always had some excuse that like, you know, this wasn't really my thing. Like, I mean, it, like, I don't really understand the landscape. I don't really know what's like going on with this. This is maybe a little bit too far outside, like the kind of stuff I usually do. Um, and with, with this war in particular, like, I felt like I literally had no excuse. Like if, if there, if there ever was a time, I mean, I, ha I have a Slavic degree for goodness sakes. Like, you know, if there ever was a time that like, this is the thing that is my business absolutely to go do um, that, that was it. And, um, you know, both 
both my department and the library um, have been very supportive. And you know, for the first like, you know, three or four months, this was literally all I did um, with with their blessing, you know, and with, what they said to me was, you know, there's nothing that we can ask you to do that's more important than this. Like you go do this and like everything else can wait. Great. I think to to kind of follow up on that to, to bounce back and forth a little bit, um, just the kind of last comment that I would like to make on the on the subject of history is the fact that this is something that we have seen play out time and time again um, with the destruction, in particular of, of physical materials, um, monuments, etc. And it is not strictly, obviously, restricted to Europe, but this sort of method of physical attacks on tangible history and intangible history, preventing people from speaking certain languages, um, which many of us being from the United States, obviously we are very familiar with that being done in the United States. Um, so all of these kind of different methods that play into epistemicide, preventing people from using their knowledge systems and, and keeping living knowledge systems. Um, in particular, when this started happening, it made me think of Bosnia in the 1990s as well. So this is not something that we have not seen before. Um, and unfortunately, I think the very harsh reality of this is not only can we not expect this to end immediately, but we also cannot expect to not see it again. Um, and I think knowing that is a very important part of how we can discuss peace, both just on very small scale conversations over coffee, um, in personal conversations, but also globally. Um, and as kind of a weird segue, the reason that I ended up getting into this was um, sort of like what, what Quinn had just said. I had obviously seen other, other things before, conflicts globally, et cetera, crises, um, and always thought, I really wish I could do something to help with that, even if it's just something small, but I just, I never had the time and there was never an opportunity that presented itself to me. And frankly, I never looked hard enough. Um, I came to Sucho about a month in, I started in April of 2022. Um, and I saw someone that I know um, from my, uh, my cohort doing my MLIS posted about it. And I was like, I can do that. I, I have expertise. I can use that. I can do this. I can actually do something that will help. Um, so it was just kind of a, a strange sense of a perfect storm where I had had by accident fell into um, an area of specific study in, in library and information science. Um, I got a job sort of by accident working with digital collections, um, which proved to be exactly what I wanted to do, even though I didn't know it at the time. Um, and I worked specifically on metadata projects and then ended up staying with my department for a permanent role. Um, and something that I think is probably not actually common knowledge among my peers at Sucho, my degree was about two months old when I started. <laughs> So I had just graduated and so I had the time, even though I had just started a permanent role. So everything lined up kind of exactly how I needed it to for me to be able to, to contribute. So I'm very grateful in as bad as the situation is, obviously that I wish I had not had this opportunity. I'm grateful that I at least was kind of right where I needed to be to, to contribute. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Thank you, Kylie. I think I'll just quickly say, because I know we're probably running over time, but um, I am Polish. I was born in Poland and my um, pretty much entire family is still in Poland, except for my parents and myself and my grandmother who are here in the States. Um, so we have very deep ties to not only Poland, but other areas of Eastern Europe. And the reason I um, wanted to do something and started Sucho with my co-founders was mainly because um, I do a lot of social justice work and advocacy work um, in kind of different areas of, of my own career in library science, but also in my own community where I live. Um, and I felt, you know, that my family and my, um, you know, ancestors have gone through a lot of oppression as well. Um, especially under Soviet rule during communism in Poland. Um, and so this was a way that I knew how to help. 
and to help preserve a culture of, you know, our neighbors, right? Literally right next to us in Poland. Um, and so that this was something I felt like I can do it. And I never expected it to grow into this enormous initiative of, you know, 1500 plus people around the globe. Um, and it's amazing that it has, and it's brought together so many different, um, I think, you know, unique people and expertise um, with different expertise and so forth. Um, so yeah, I'm excited to see what I guess we'll do in the next year um, and how, how much more we can, we can help. Jeannie, you're still muted, dear. Thank you. Thank you so much for who you are and what you do. Um, as, a, as a Jewish person whose culture has often been, at least the, the heritage, our heritage has so often um, tried to be victimized and have, has been victimized by so many people. It's wonderful to see people who are out there fighting to save heritage and to save culture. And had it only happened 50 years ago, and, and in other periods of time, maybe, um, whether it's digital or not, we, we all must try to preserve people's heritage. And I'm grateful that you're on the front lines doing this work. Um, I, I will hope that our, we will on our website, um, Hillary put up some of these web, some of these websites like the gallery and other places that people can look to get information and can donate. And part of the proceeds from tonight, of course, you know, has been donated to you. But um, I wish you good luck and thank you again. And good night, everybody. Thank you for joining us. Thank you very much. I, thank, you, us. thank you, everyone. Bye-bye, everybody. Have a good night. Thank you. Have a great